the good news is that we are not going to give you more geometrical optics. Uh, uh, we're going to spend at least the next two sessions on wave optics. And I thought I'll, it'll have to be quite brief, a kind of tour uh, where various things will be pointed out to you. And then later on, you can go and investigate any of them more deeply. And uh, the left column is probably what we will get through today. And uh, the right side is probably for the next session. Um, basically, you know, we kept talking about light, but we never said anything about the electromagnetic nature of light or the source of light. So I have to fill in that deficiency. And then our basic mathematical tool will be the use of complex numbers. And uh, you already had a little feel for that because when we gave you a small quiz to assess your preparation for this course, complex numbers were also part of it. So I hope you're there. Then the next is a topic which we normally don't encounter in optics courses, but it's quite interesting and quite important or quite modern also, very much 1970s and so on. That is whether you can put light into reverse gear. And I'll tell you what that means. And uh, then we will start superposing waves. Okay. And the fundamental idea is that if you have the usual wave with which your textbook begins, plane electromagnetic wave going in some, say, uh, X direction, and then the electric field is in the Y direction and the magnetic field is in the Z direction, right? That's only one possible wave. Or if you want to think mathematically, one possible solution of the wave equation. But that equation is a linear equation. So once you have one solution, you can add many solutions and you get more interesting solutions. And we'll be interested in that. We'll be talking of what are called wave packets, okay? So that's kind of the menu. So, so uh, the simplest kind of source one can think of is a charge. So you place it at the origin of the coordinates, which is oscillating up and down, say, along the z-axis, with some frequency omega and some amplitude and some phase. Okay. And, uh, and, of course, depending on how you choose the time t equal to zero, z may not be at a maximum. So this phi can be called the initial phase. Okay. Um, and we'd like to know, we already have seen how the electric field uh, varies uh, with time. Electric field is proportional to the acceleration of this charge. Okay. But uh, of course, if you look in the, this equatorial direction, the motion of the charge is parallel to the tangent to the sphere. So uh, the full acceleration contributes. But if you look in this direction, uh, this is entirely longitudinal. And light waves are transverse, so you don't get any electric field. And in between, you have a variation which goes as the cosine of this angle. So it becomes 0. And that's what's also shown by the length of these arrows, which represent the oscillation of the electric field, which is in a plane transverse to the direction of propagation. So these are the facts which are summarized here. We can also ask, how does the strength of the electric field behave as we go further and further away from the charge? And electromagnetic theory tells us that that behaves as 1 by r. But even without electromagnetic theory, you can understand this 1 by r. Uh, the uh, intensity, that is energy per unit area, per unit time, uh, will be proportional to the square of this electric field, so 1 by r squared. And then the area of the sphere is proportional to r squared. If you multiply these two, it tells you that even if you have spheres of different radius, the total energy going through the sphere is going to be the same because there's no absorption. And the last remark I'd like to make is that uh, uh, if you go very far away from the source and you only look at a small portion of the sphere, you will think that it's a plain electromagnetic wave. The strength will not fall off very much. right? because R is not changing very much, it's so very large. Then, uh, so we'll now uh, move to the plane electromagnetic wave. But before that, uh, you saw a trigonometric function. And we are going to think of trigonometric functions not the usual way, but as exponential functions. And uh, this is a very interesting piece of mathematics, which most of you would have seen. 
But what I would like to highlight is that one of the finest writers on undergraduate physics, uh, Richard Feynman, in his uh, lectures, volume one, which was really intended for undergraduates like you. In fact, maybe undergraduates who have less equipment than you, because he actually talks about basic things like algebra and complex numbers in uh, his uh, chapter 22 of volume one. And he has this fantastic admiration for this formula. He calls it the jewel. He calls it the most remarkable formula in mathematics. And it basically says that the exponential of i times some angle has a real part, which is the cosine of the angle, and an imaginary part, which is the sine of the angle. So this is Feynman's word in praise of this formula. And of course, uh, this formula was invented by Euler and almost everything interesting in mathematics was invented by Euler. Uh, and uh, one can think of it in the following way. You have an x-axis, you have a y-axis. You can use x and y as polar coordinates, uh, sorry, Cartesian coordinates. And you can use this distance r and this angle theta as polar coordinates. And, uh, X, the conversion is x equal to r cos theta and y equal to r sin theta. And if you combine x and y into a complex number, x plus iy, then you get r into cos theta plus i sin theta. So r is this distance, which you call the magnitude of the complex number. And theta is what we call the phase of the complex number. So complex numbers can either be thought of as real imaginary parts or as magnitude phase parts. And from our optics point of view, magnitude phase is irrelevant because we've already seen you know, that we have a cosine of uh, omega t minus phi. So here is uh, the plane linearly polarized electromagnetic wave. So uh, this wave is propagating along some unit vector n and we have drawn a plane perpendicular to that which means that if we move in this plane, the distance from the source doesn't change. And therefore, neither the phase nor the amplitude of the electromagnetic wave changes. This is really what we would call a wave front, a surface of constant phase. And uh, the electric field is going to lie in this transverse plane. And we have chosen a unit vector E, and the electric field is going to oscillate along E. So this is the uh, simplest, a simple example of a plane electromagnetic wave. Okay? And this is how the electric field at some point R would be uh, expressed. Uh, let's say the origins on this plane, this particular plane, which might be uh, x equal to zero. So y and z are lying in the plane, x is equal to zero. Then if you uh, go to some vector R, only the x component of that vector R will contribute to the time delay. A time delay between the wave passing this point and the wave reaching R. So T minus N dot R divided by C will be the oscillation at this point R if the oscillation at this point is cos omega T. And in addition, of course, at T equal to zero, you might have some phase phi. Okay? And A is amplitude, and E being a vector quantity, we have attached this unit vector E. So this is the standard way of writing linearly polarized electromagnetic wave. Uh, but the way that we are going to use, uh, we are going to use Euler's formula, the dual, and think of cos as the real part. So this uh, funny looking R stands for real part of whatever you have inside the cos, take exponential, and actually you can take exponential plus i omega or exponential minus i omega. That doesn't matter because the real part is anyway going to be cos. The imaginary part will, of course, change sign, depending on whether you choose the convention as minus or plus. Now, historically, uh, people in optics have chosen the convention minus. Uh, unfortunately, people in electrical engineering have chosen the convention plus, but uh, they also call this J, okay? <laughs> so in case some of you have taken engineering courses, uh, please put up with this notation, right? So next step is, to take this part, exponential um, minus, which doesn't depend on space and time. This doesn't depend on space and time. This doesn't depend on space and time. So we separate them. Okay. Right. 
so uh, minus and minus so this becomes a exponential plus i5 it's a complex number we call it z we call it the uh, it's a complex amplitude of the wave normally the word amplitude is loosely referred to as a maybe we'll call a as magnitude and z is a complex amplitude which tells you both how strong the wave is and what its phase is of course the phase is at r equal to 0 and t equal to 0 and at any other point we know how to calculate the phase the other thing we are going to do is this is the time delay n dot r divided by c between the origin and the point r we are going to combine it with this omega uh, and then minus and minus will again give you a plus right and you will get uh, Okay. Yeah. You will get this form so that you introduce this vector k, and we are going to extensively use this k, right? uh, which is nothing but uh, omega by c combined with this n. Okay. And then uh, this entire space dependent part becomes just k dot r with a plus sign. Hmm? So it's once you've been working in optics long enough, if you're woken up in the middle of the night and told write down a plane electromagnetic wave, you will say exponential of minus i into omega t minus k dot r. Okay. And uh, the magnitude of k is omega by c. You can also see that if k multiplies r to give you the phase, k is the phase change per unit length. And uh, we know that to convert length to phase, you have to divide by lambda and multiply by 2 pi. So you can either think of it as omega by c times this unit vector in the direction of propagation or as omega by c, I mean 2 pi by lambda. So, uh, so we have a nice uh, duality between omega, which is the phase change per unit time, and uh, k, which is the phase change per unit length. But of course, k is a vector because the phase only changes if you move perpendicular to the wavefront. It doesn't change if you move parallel to it. So please uh, do keep in mind this complex electric field. And uh, as I said, you work in optics long enough, the complex field becomes more real than the real field. So a few more remarks on the plane uh, monochromatic wave. I already told you intensity is proportional to the square of the electric field. Right? Uh, now, of course, in the real form, if you square it, uh, this is what you would guess. So it's really oscillating as a function of time and space. But uh, what we are really interested in is the average. If you think of the spatial variation, it's on the scale of the wavelength, and the time variation is on the scale of the uh, period, which for visible light can be measured in femtoseconds. Right? So it makes sense to talk of an average intensity, which is I bar. So if you just have call this angle theta, we square it. Cos square can also be written as half of 1 plus cos 2 theta. And then when you average, this cos averages to 0 and you get a squared by 2. So anyway, since we are only talk of proportionality, the average intensity is proportional to a squared. And since we are going to use complex amplitude, z, we want to get rid of the phi. So the way to get rid of the phi is take z and multiply it by its complex conjugate. And there are two notations for complex conjugate, bar and star. <laughs> Uh, you will find that as per my convenience, I will use either of them. Okay. So this is just a remark because you will see me using this formula Z, Z bar quite a bit. Now, polarization is a topic that I'm keeping for beyond these two lectures because it's very interesting in its own right. So right now, I will just make this remark that polarization being the direction of the electric vector, uh, the case I gave you is just pointing along some unit vector E in the transverse plane. Okay. But that's not the most general case. Okay. So you might have uh, a wave which is polarized along x, another which is polarized along y. Both have the same frequency, both have the same direction of propagation, but they need not have the same phase. Right? So a general polarized wave will be described by two complex amplitudes. Okay. So just keep this in mind for a couple of lectures later. And now we're going to more or less forget about polarization. Okay. We'll come back. 
And this is just again reminding you of everything I told you about K. Now I want to come to a, uh, something to do with the physics of light and the nature of light. And this is uh, an observation. If you had not been in lockdown, I would have told you to go to the nearest pond or lake and bend over it and look into it. And if it's not too polluted, you will be able to see the bottom of the pond, whatever stones uh, is there. And you'll also be able to see your face, which means that the surface of the pond uh, both transmits and reflects light. So it's a partially reflecting surface. Uh, of course, during lockdown, you look out of your window, uh, like the glass window usually, and uh, on the one hand, you will see outside, see this uh, veranda and building down below. You also see a reflection of whatever is in the room. Okay. Now, such a simple observation actually raises uh, deep questions about the nature of light. And in fact, uh, Huygens, who was a great rival of Newton, it was uh, not just in optics actually. In fact, people say that Huygens would have been remembered as a very great scientist, but for the misfortune of being a contemporary of Newton, actually slightly earlier. But he gave this powerful argument saying that if you have partial reflection, it's not difficult to understand for light waves. So the wave has an amplitude, which is a continuous variable, and intensity, which is a continuous variable. And you can divide it. Say if you're dividing it 50-50, then you just uh, divide the energy 50-50 and you get two waves, each with half the energy, or one over square root of two times the amplitude. But suppose you're Newton and you believe in particles, and these particles are indivisible. Okay? So an individual uh, particle approaches the surface. What do you mean by saying that uh, it's a 50% reflecting surface? All that it could mean is that there's a 50% probability that it gets reflected and a 50% probability that it gets transmitted. And Newton was smart enough to realize this. And he had his own model for this probability, which we won't worry about. Okay? Now, of course, people didn't worry about it later because they said he was wrong. And Huygens was right. Light consists of waves. Any number of experiments prove it until the early 20th century when experiments came along with the photoelectric effect and uh, Einstein had the courage to say that, yes, light does consist of individual particles. That's the only way you can understand the photoelectric effect. He wrote this paper when he was only 26 years old. It's very different from his papers on relativity and Brownian motion, which are completely masterly, where he has all the answers, basically. But in this paper, he says it's a very provisional viewpoint. I'm not sure how we will understand the wave properties, but we are forced to think of light in terms of particles. So, we will come back to what happens to interference experiments when you deal with individual photons. Okay. But as of now, uh, we are forced to say that the absolute square, absolute because we are getting rid of the phase, of this complex amplitude is the probability. Now let's ask, is it just enough to have probabilities or do we need these complex amplitudes? We already see that we need them to understand interference and usually discussions of interference start with Young's experiment. But I would like to choose a much later experiment, uh, 1890s, because uh, it's very nice. Uh, it's named after the two people who developed it. So here is the experiment. Start with the source. You want a plane wave. So either you take it to infinity, in which case you will have no light left, or you put a lens and convert this diverging spherical wavefront into a plane wave which then falls on a half silvered mirror. So exactly this 50-50, uh, it's called a beam splitter. So half the intensity goes this way, half the intensity goes that way. And this is made very symmetric. So that this uh, path is equal to this path, this path, is, yeah, this is equal to this, this is equal to this. And then the two, these are 100% reflecting mirrors. And this is a beam splitter which is identical to this, except its job is not to split the beams. It's job is to combine these two beams. How does that work? Uh, part of this beam goes through, so you get some complex number T multiplying the amplitude of this beam, and that is what goes here. Now, why am I saying T is a complex number? Because this may change the magnitude as well as the phase of the incoming wave. Okay. Uh, then 
this is also multiplied by some complex number r and goes to detector 2. But the same is true for the wave coming from below. So ultimately detector 1 gets a combination of uh, this wave with the coefficient t and this wave with the coefficient r. And this one of course gets uh, the left hand wave with the coefficient r and this one coefficient t. Okay. So this is also a beam combiner. It's not just a beam splitter. Mm -hmm. Now uh, the real use of the max Zander interferometer is to put something in one of the beams and see how it modifies the amplitude and phase of the beam. Okay. And that's why they invented it. But for the moment, let us not put this sample in. Okay. So then in a completely symmetric configuration, you can convince yourself that all the light will go to detector one. Why is that? This comes here. Uh, you get some R, 100% T. Otherwise you get T, 100% reflection, and then R. So if you've made everything symmetric, all the parts are equal and so on, the two waves which fall on detector one are completely in phase. There's no reason for them to have any phase difference. And therefore, you will get constructive interference in detector one. Okay. Of course, the total energy is conserved. So you better get zero intensity in detector two. Now, how is that going to happen? Uh, this comes along, R, R again. So uh, the sample beam contributes R squared. And uh, the other reference beam, which is RB, the lower beam, contributes T, T. So here you get R squared plus T squared. And that had better be zero, right? Because all the energy is gone here. And that's interesting. How can R squared plus T squared be zero? Only if they are complex numbers, right? So in a sense, this max interferometer forces you, if you believe in energy conservation, to uh, uh, think of reflection and transmission coefficients as complex numbers. Okay. Now, of course, if I now put in a piece of glass which creates a phase difference of 180 degrees, all the light will be switched to detector 2. Okay. Now, an obvious question to ask is what happens if one photon enters the system? Okay. If you took the point of view that it either goes through this beam or goes through this beam, you'll be in trouble. Okay. So then how can they interfere? Okay. So the interesting experimental question is, will a device like this work even if you have single photons? Okay. Uh, we'll come to the history later. Uh, and interestingly, you all heard of the Mach number, right? Which is uh, the speed of an aircraft or a bullet or anything divided by the speed of sound. And this is a fundamental concept in aerodynamics. And believe it or not, uh, this interferometer is used. Here you would put some kind of wind tunnel and you would have fire bullets through it. And the slight change in the refractive index of air would be detected by this interferometric technique. So anyway, uh, the single photon level was checked by another person called Taylor who again is famous for his contributions to fluid mechanics and aerodynamics, not so much to optics. But when he was very young, he set up a Young's experiment, but ensured that the intensity is so low that only one photon would be inside the box. So he shut the box, put this very weak source with a lot of adsorption, uh, put a film and went off on a holiday. And several weeks later, he developed it and he saw the fringes. So therefore, we are forced uh, to a description of these photons as being particles, but having an amplitude which can go both ways and an amplitude which can interfere. And this is the fundamental feature of quantum mechanics. So I promised you in the poster that wave optics will shed some light on quantum mechanics. And we are already seeing that. Uh, in fact, quantum mechanics, if one had to just state the basic principle of quantum mechanics, this is done in the Feynman lectures, either in volume one in these two lectures or in volume three in these two lectures, they are identical. Okay. A particle is described by complex numbers, which if you square, you get the probability. But if you don't square them and you add them, then they can even interfere destructively. And something like say detector two, which had a probability of being reached by either path, may still have zero probability of being reached when both the paths are available to the party. 
So let us uh, think about this beam stretcher a little more. Uh, so uh, we'll now think of it as a general beam combiner. An amplitude A coming from the left, amplitude B coming from below. So RA plus TB going up, TA plus RB going to the right. And we'll just work out the law of conservation of energy for this. Now, if you had just had one coming in and R going here and T going here, then R bar R would be the intensity of the uh, reflected wave and T bar T would be the intensity of the transmitted wave. And the sum of those should be one because the incoming intensity is one and you're not losing any light, no absorbing elements. So that's the obvious part. But actually there's a deeper relationship between R and T which you will get if you apply energy conservation to the most general case where A com comes from here and B comes from here. So let me do that. So total uh, intensity coming in is A bar A plus B bar B. Okay. From here and here. And what about what comes out? You take this complex number here, multiply it by its complex conjugate. Take this complex number and multiply it by its conjugate. Add these two. And that had better be equal to the left hand side. Now, if you look at the coefficient of A bar A, you will get the same relationship again. R bar R plus uh, T bar T on the left. Multiplying A bar plus B B bar. So this is one. But you can also look at the coefficient of other things. So this is a small problem which you can solve. If you look at the coefficient of something like A B bar plus A bar B, then you get this interesting condition that R bar into T plus T bar into R has to be zero. So that's a constraint between the reflection and transmission coefficients placed by the conservation of energy. And just doing a little division, uh, this condition can be rewritten as R bar divided by R is minus T bar divided by T. Now suppose R has some phase. So you would have E to the I phi in the denominator, E to the minus I phi in the numerator. So when you do the division, you will have E to the minus two I phi. And here again, you will have e to the minus 2i5 for the transmission question. So it tells you that these two are related by a minus sign. Now, how is that possible? Only if the relative phase of the reflection and transmission coefficients is pi by 2 plus or minus. Then you can check that this equation will be satisfied and this equation will be satisfied. What you're really saying is if you have t, then r should be proportional to i times t. So this equation will have a minus i and this equation will have a, a plus i. Okay. Right. So this is interesting that the constraint of conservation of energy puts a powerful limitation on the uh, reflection and transmission coefficients of this beam splitter. But actually we can now make a very wild leap and say in quantum mechanics, you are now talking about conservation of probability. If various things can happen to your particle, the probability should add up to one. But if the probabilities are squares of complex numbers, some similar argument will apply. So another connection with quantum mechanics. And uh, the name of this condition is based on the fact that if you uh, represent these relations by matrices, which you can, you know, TA plus RB and RA plus TB can represent as a matrix. That's going to be the first problem assigned to you uh, after this lecture. And that matrix happens to be a particular kind of matrix called a unitary matrix, but that's for the problem session. Now, this is uh, an interferometer which is more famous than the Maxander interferometer. It's called the Michelson interferometer. So Michelson was a stingy man, so he used only one beam splitter and used it both to divide the beam and to recombine the beam. So these mirrors were not at 45 degrees. They were placed in such a way that the reflected beam was sent back, and this was sent back. And then at least, of course, there's a bit of a problem with putting detectors in both these places because one of these is the source, okay? But if you ignore that problem for a moment, we can ask the following question. What happens to the concept of reversibility of light? Now, of course, we stated it for light rays. How does it apply to light waves? Okay. So one comes in, 
R goes to this mirror. Uh, of course, there is also some phase because of this distance, but we are going to assume that it's all very symmetric and you have exactly the same phase for this distance travel. It's a symmetric adjustment of the Michelson interferometer. If you have ever had to do it, you know it's quite difficult. Uh, in any case, you have R coming back. And now, of course, it gets transmitted and you get R times T. Now, if you follow the other wave, you get T, T coming back, now reflected. So you get 2 RT. And uh, if you now look at uh, what happens to the other parts of this R, again reflected R squared, and this is T squared. In fact, we saw this in the Max Zander, that one of the channels gets R squared plus T squared, and the other gets 2R. In fact, let's assume that we are dealing with uh, a 50-50 beam spread. So the magnitude of R and the magnitude of T is 1 over square root of 2. Okay. So and, uh, the phases, of course, may differ have to differ by 90 degrees. In any case, the magnitude of this is going to be 2 divided by 2, which is 1. So in the Michelson, what happens is you send in light from here and in the perfectly symmetrical configuration, all the light goes back here. And we all already saw if this is 1 over root, these two have opposite signs because the phases differ by pi by 2. So these two, oh, half and half will cancel. You get nothing here. So it looks as if we are seeing a violation of the principle of reversibility of light. The light comes in here, something complicated happens, but instead of coming out here, it comes back here. And uh, this is, I told you that we'll discuss how to put light in reverse gear. So we're first going to do it uh, uh, mathematically. Now, I'm going to ask you to imagine that there is some new kind of mirror, not the one that Michelson used. And in fact, that mirror was only made in 1970s. R falls on it, it sends back the complex conjugate of R. What the physical meaning of that is, we'll see. So be a little patient and let's just look at the mathematics. So R star comes here. If T goes here, T star comes here. Okay. So now what happens? T star gets uh, hit by R, so R T star, and then R star gets hit by T. Okay. So here you get R T star plus T R star. If you replace the stars by bars, you will see that this is actually the quantity which we proved to be zero. Right? What about what comes back here? R star R plus T star T. Right? R, R star. Which is one. So the principle of reversibility of light rays seems to be satisfied, but you seem to be compelled to take the complex conjugate of the light ray. Now, what's the physical meaning of this? Mm. Now, uh, the idea of time reversal before going to electro electrodynamics, let's understand it very briefly in mechanics. If you have some movie of some particles moving around under some forces, maybe colliding with each other, just play the movie backwards. Okay. And, uh, if that still works, then you have a principle of reversibility in mechanics. Mm -hmm. So I have a little graph illustrating that. You have some particle. It's moving in one dimension. Y is the dimension along which the particle moves. T is time. So the particle starts from the origin at some negative value of time, takes off in the positive direction. Some force acts on it, pulls it back. And of course, it can keep going, but we'll stop the graph here. Now I'm going to reflect the graph in the uh, y-axis. So now you get this graph. So this is exactly like running the movie backwards, right? Because what is the final state here is the initial state here. And if you uh, take some point A on the original graph, where the particle at some velocity, uh, at the point B, it will have a reverse velocity. Slope is the opposite. Huh? Uh, so that's what you expect if you run the movie backwards. Now, uh, if you want to think of this mathematically, uh, you want to make sure Newton's second law is obeyed for both these curves. And Newton's second law, uh, if it contains the velocity, you'll be in trouble. Okay. Because that will have the opposite sign here and here. But if you have, say, a, a force like a restoring force or a gravitational force, it depends only on R. And then the acceleration, interestingly, has the same value here and here. You can check by taking this function and this function and differentiating both with respect to time. And 
at the two corresponding points, it'll have the same value. Okay. So actually in mechanics, uh, provided you don't have velocity dependent forces, okay, this works. Now what about electromagnets? So let's take our plane electromagnetic wave and change T to minus, minus T. The original wave was omega T minus K dot R minus phi. All I've done is change T to minus T. Okay, I've kept the electric field the same, the direction same, everything. Now, since cos is an even function, I can rewrite it in this way, cos of omega T plus K dot R plus phi. Then, in our complex notation, it's the real part of A exponential minus I phi. Now, remember it was plus I phi earlier, when we were, now it's minus I phi. And now you have minus I omega T as before, but now the sign of K dot R has changed. Now, actually all this makes uh, physical sense also. Hmm? So K is reversed. That's very reasonable, right? If there's an electromagnetic wave propagating in some direction, when the movie is run in reverse, it'll be propagating in the reverse direction. Then this complex amplitude, which was earlier a exponential i phi is now exponential minus i phi. So it's been changed to its complex conjugate. Now, why is it that you need to change the amplitude to its complex conjugate? Okay. When? We'll see that. Um, what it's really telling you is that a phase, what was a phase lag for an original wave, lag is you know an oscillation which is following another oscillation but whatever the first one does it's doing it later that's what we mean by lag and the way we have set up our conventions a positive value of phi is lag okay but what this is telling you is that if you have something propagating along k and uh, there's a lag and the experiment is as follows you have some source there is a half silvered mirror here but uh, right now we are concerned with what goes through the mirror. So you have this uh, diverging wave. Then it goes through some very irregular piece of glass. So the wavefront gets completely distorted, right? You have something, uh, got it right? Yeah, this is delayed because uh, it had to go move slower in the glass. Here the thickness of glass will rest, so this went ahead. But now uh, the phase conjugate mirror says, PCA mode, as we were told in NCC. So now the wave is going back. So now this guy is actually leading this guy. Okay. And of course, the glass slows it down. So the error gets compensated. And what comes out is a perfect wavefront. Also, notice it's a wavefront which is converging at the source. If it had been an ordinary mirror, it would have been a wavefront which is diverging from the image. Okay. Now, in order to verify this experimentally, you would have to go back to the source and catch this wavefront, which is a bit inconvenient. Because you've already got a source there, you don't want to put a detector in the same place. So the simple idea is to use this half silver mirror and part of this wavefront goes here and you image it there. So with this little background, you will really enjoy this uh, video. It's, it's a very dramatic demonstration. Um, as I said, that was a bit of a digression. And now we will return to our main theme, which is combining different waves. Okay. In fact, one of the earliest introductions one gets to combining, not even waves, combining oscillations, is the phenomenon in acoustics called beats, okay. where you now have two different frequencies. Okay. So forget optics for a moment. You're just combining some waves with two different frequencies. Right. But we will use our complex notation for waves. Okay. So our wave is the real part of this whole thing, but we will just write the complex part. Uh, so one of the waves has a frequency omega zero plus some delta omega. The other wave has a frequency omega zero minus delta omega. So the difference in frequencies is two omega, sorry, two delta omega, and the average frequency is omega zero. So then what we do is we remove this average frequency as a common factor. And then what you're left with inside the bracket is exponential minus i into some angle and exponential plus i into some angle. And using the magic formula, the imaginary parts cancel and you get twice the cosine of this angle, okay? 
So this is what you get. So if you have this average frequency of omega zero, but then you combine two waves whose frequencies differ from it by delta omega on either direction, then you get back your original wave, but now it's multiplied by something else. Or in fact, the word used by electrical engineers is modulated. Right? And it's modulated by twice cos of a frequency, which is half the difference of these two. Okay, so uh, yeah, so here is a simple graph here. I think I choose omega zero to be equal to five and delta omega to be equal to half, and this total length is 20. So what you see is that you have this wave of the higher frequency, omega zero, and that gets multiplied by this red curve, right? In the red curve, by the way, this is zero, so it goes both positive and negative, okay? So although this looks identical to this, it's really not identical. Here the maximum is in the center, here the ma max mag negative maximum is in the center. That's because the modulation has changed sign. Okay. However, if you look at the intensity, if you square it, then your period will be between this and this. Right? Intensity will be, if you look at the square, then this also gets squared. So that's the reason for the, you might, some of you might have worried that this frequency of modulation is delta omega, it should have been the difference frequency, which is twice delta omega. And the reason is that you see this difference frequency if you only look at the intensity, if you square it. Then you get cos square of delta omega t, which contains a cos of twice delta omega into t. So just keep that in mind. Now, uh, this is, we are going to deal with more complicated cases, combining more frequencies, so therefore, we want some more general way of looking at this and a more intuitive way also if we don't want to do detailed calculations. So now the same thing I'm going to show you in terms of these complex numbers. Uh, so this part, uh, let's not worry about for the moment. Okay? It's a common factor. We can put it in at the end. So this part, if you look at one of these terms, it's exponential minus i delta omega into t. And minus i corresponds to rotating in the uh, clockwise direction. So that's this. And this rotates in the anti-clockwise direction, positive. So really, we are being asked to combine two vectors, with, which, if you forget this factor for a moment, which are rotating in opposite directions. Of course, in addition, both the vectors are being rotated at this frequency, omega 0. So this whole diagram is being carried around like this. But if you're interested in the strength of the electric field, you have to just add these two rotating in opposite directions. So at t equal to zero, they're going to add up and give you a long vector. Then this rotates this way, this rotates this way, they will cancel. Then they will develop on the negative side. So that's this point. And then they'll again come back to zero and so on. So uh, when you use complex numbers in this way to represent uh, addition of waves, uh, the term phasor is sometimes used. P H A S O R. Right. Uh, incidentally, the only way of adding two vectors is not to put their starting points. Some people prefer to take the first vector and uh, then attach the second vector with the tail and then look at the sum. Same thing, but maybe one's intuition uh, for certain things may be better here. So now you realize that the magnitude of the sum of these two vectors only depends on the angle relative to these two vectors. So you can even make this stop and make this rotate at twice delta omega, right? You can do that. So you will see more phasor diagrams, which is why I spent a little extra time on this one. Now, uh, we are going to take two light waves. It's two, not W, okay? Um, I told you that the wave vector K can be thought of as a spatial frequency, telling you what the variation of uh, the phase is with respect to space. So now I'm going to take the same frequency. So the magnitude of the wave vector omega over c is going to be the same. But now the directions are going to be different. We are going to superpose or interfere two waves with the same direction. Uh, so now I'm, I have a diagram, but all warning, <laughs> these are no k vectors. They are not phases. Phases are vectors representing a complex number. Okay, so one 
wave is traveling like that, one wave is traveling like that. Now, if we let's just do the same mathematics, right? K1 dot R plus K2 dot R, take out the common factor, which is the average. K1 plus K2 by 2 dot R. And where it, what is K1 plus K2 by 2? It is a black vector here. And this is being modulated by uh, another wave whose wave vector is K1 minus K2. Now I'm deliberately choosing these two, making a very small angle with each other. In fact, I think I called it two alpha in some later problem. So this K1 minus K2 is a small uh, wave vector. And uh, that represents a long periodicity, right? Because remember, wave vector contains lambda in the denominator. It's two by the lambda. So the equivalent of beats is, and of course, that's what we just call fringes, when you superpose two waves traveling in nearly the same direction, but not exactly, then if you look at the sum of those waves and look at the intensity, so this is, ah, by the way, this is the same as cosine, twice cosine of k1 minus k2. So, uh, finally, I think one picture is worth a thousand words and maybe even worth a hundred equations. Okay, so here's the picture. So this is one way and this is the other way. So let's think of black as some value of the phase and white as the phase which is 180 degrees with respect to that. So uh, this is uh, right? uh, black on black. Sorry, this is black on white. That's why the entire light is blocked. Whereas this is black on black and white on white. Right? So these are the regions of constructive interference. And uh, these are the regions of destructivity. Okay. And notice interestingly that these fringes are not precisely perpendicular to either this wave or this wave. Right? You can see that in the figure. Uh, and that corresponds to the fact that this K1 minus K2 is not perpendicular to K1 or K2. It's perpendicular to the average of K1 and K2. So if you ever have to teach Young's interference experiment. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can just set up a simple demonstration with two combs, which will show this. And really, this you think of this as what happens on the screen in Young's interference experiment. So the source is very far away. So it's emitting a plane wave almost, one of the source. And the other source is emitting another plane wave. And there's a small angle between them. So that also tells you that this derivation we usually go through uh, some xd by capital D and all is really bringing in a lot of irrelevant things. The only relevant thing is what is the wavelength and what is the angle between these two waves at the screen. Uh, could resist another digression, small digression. <coughs> when you make fringes with uh, two combs or two layers of fabric or something, these are called moiré patterns. And once you know how to look for moiré patterns, actually moiré is the way we pronounce it in English, I think the French who invented this form of silk, uh, call it moiré or something like that. And the way this is made is by you fold the cloth into two layers and then you roll it so the two layers stick to each other. And of course, they will never be perfectly aligned, so you get this beautiful effect. And this is considered very expensive, so, but however, you can just take any synthetic fabric. Synthetic because the spacing tends to be a little more uniform there. And just put two la layers on top of each other and look through it or just put two wire mesh or combs. So what I showed you on the previous uh, uh, picture is just a moiré pattern. Okay. Now, uh, what we have dealt with so far is combining two frequencies or two wave vectors and getting a modulated wave. Um, now, uh, once you, you go to two, you would like to go to larger numbers, right? And there's a good reason for this. See, a plain monochromatic wave is fine as a mathematical concept, but physically it extends infinitely in space and time. No limitation on R and so on in T. And that's not very realistic. But it's still useful because we can interfere these waves and we can make more realistic wave packets. We have finite extent in space and finite extent in time. Okay? And we are just going to do that in the last part of the lecture. 
we have already done a little bit of that. We saw that by making superposing just two ways, you could get beads or you could get fringes. So maybe if you superpose more waves, in fact, a continuous family of waves, then you might get a situation where you get one beat or one fringe, and then after that, the amplitude falls. falls. And uh, like I told you right in the beginning of this lecture, uh, this is allowed. If you have some solutions to whatever equations are satisfied by electromagnetic waves, provided those equations are linear, you can add solutions. And you can get more interesting solutions. And you need not even add them with equal uh, amplitudes. You can. So we are now going to construct uh, one wave packet in time and one wave packet in space to round off this lecture. So earlier we had, so now the average frequency is still being called omega zero. Now, earlier we just had omega 0 plus delta omega and omega 0 minus delta omega. But now we want omega 0 plus something. That something I'm calling omega. So this omega is really small, which varies all the way from minus delta omega to plus delta. And we want to add all these waves. Now, adding an infinite number of objects is uh, fortunately something we all know. It's called integration. Okay. Uh, so this is the common factor. So you have omega 0 plus omega. Omega is a frequency offset from the average frequency. And that offset goes from minus delta omega to plus delta omega. Now, purely for convenience, I have put a 2 delta omega here. Uh, and the reason is, first, let us look at this when t is equal to 0. At 0 time, this is just equal to 1. So uh, the integral is just equal to twice delta omega, which cancels this twice delta omega. So this is just a normalization factor to ensure that at t equal to 0, you have a unit amplitude wave. But at later time, remember, you will have this wave, which is going at a high frequency, but it will be modulated by this factor. Now, it would really be an insult to all of you for me to sit down and do this integral. Right? So I will just tell you what the answer is. Yeah. Can do this integral. Of course, I have combined this factor also. Um, everything nicely cancels and all that. And you get sine of delta omega t divided by delta omega into t. So this function is called, uh, sometimes called the sinc function, S I N C. We'll just think of it as sine x by x. And x is now related to delta omega. Delta omega is no longer the uh, separation of two frequencies. It's a measure of a range going all the way from minus delta omega to plus delta omega of infinite number of frequencies which are being combined to make this wave packet. So uh, we all know what this function looks like. Yeah. Uh, incidentally, <laughs> at t equal to zero, this is zero, but this is also zero, so the limit is one. Okay. And then when t is equal to pi, it falls to, uh, sorry, delta omega into t is equal to pi, it uh, falls to 0. And then it changes sign. Okay, So let me show you a small plot. So this plot, I have, I, I think I took the same value of omega 0 and delta omega as in the previous plot. Okay, uh, But I have taken the real part now. So this has been replaced by cos omega 0 t. This is already real. So this is the underlying high frequency wave and this is the modulation and now sin x by x will keep having oscillation but it gets smaller and smaller so we have now made a finite wave packet not strictly finite because but it is certainly not periodic and i want you to contrast this with the previous uh, thing where we had only two waves being combined right? then you keep getting these beats forever Now, uh, the idea was to also understand this in terms of phasors. Now, I told you that in this integral, we are uh, combining an infinite number of waves, but infinity being a large number, uh, I have just drawn seven complex numbers. At t equal to zero, they are all in phase. Okay. But uh, because they come with different values of omega, as you go to later times, they get out of phase. 
So once they are all in phase, you can either combine them this way uh, or you can combine them this way. But basically, they all add up and give you one. Hmm? Now let's uh, go to this point right, where this uh, sine function becomes zero or sinc function becomes zero. That is when omega delta omega into t is equal to pi. Hmm? So that means now if you took in the two extreme waves, uh, one of them will have a phase of plus pi, one will have a phase of minus pi, and all the others will have phases in between. So the phases range over a full angle of 2 pi. Okay. So if you want to add the phases this way, this is how they add up, and they cancel and give you 0. And uh, if you want to add them up this way, again, head to tail, again, they go around in a circle, and it is 0. Okay. Of course, it doesn't stop there. It becomes negative, right? If I increase t still further, what happens? What happens now is, in the circle, what happens is the circle doesn't close. This moves somewhere here, this moves somewhere here. And then you have, don't have perfect cancellation. Likewise, in these phasors, you will find, if you keep moving them further, see, as t increases, the angle between two of them increases. So if you keep increasing the angle further, you will find a pileup of vectors on this side. But they cannot all point in this direction, right? because their frequencies are different. So you get some partial cancellation. That's how you explain negative. And that's how you explain all these oscillations. So you may wonder, why am I giving you all these rough qualitative pictures when we already have a quantitative expression here? The answer is that it contributes to physical intuition. And we may encounter a case where we're not able to do the integral. And then we will use these arguments to get some idea of the answer. So I'd like to draw your attention to the overall size of the wave packet that we have created. Basically, it goes from delta omega t equal to minus pi to delta omega t equals plus pi. So the total extent of time is 2 pi divided by delta omega. So just keep that in mind. Uh, now, yeah, although we have only one minute left, I'll take a few more minutes because uh, I'm going to do the same thing in space. Okay. So earlier we had two wave vectors, k1 and k2, which had a common, they were all pointing along the x-axis, but their y components uh, had opposite sign. Right? That's what we had last time. And now I'm trying to see this y component has all values between some way, negative value and some positive value. So the mathematical expression for this, so this is the kind of wave packet which you would get if you were not doing a two-slit experiment. But suppose you were doing a single-slit experiment. Okay? So the single slit is again very far away and uh, every point on the single slit is contributing to you. So you can think of that point as contributing a spherical wave. You know, we are being inspired by Mr. Huygens. We are so far away that that spherical wave is like a plane wave. So we are superposing plane waves in all directions which point towards the single slit. Okay. So uh, if you remember the previous expression, this is quite analogous. Right? Now the y component of the wave vector. Now first of all, you may say, why aren't you worrying about x component of the wave vector? Uh, answer is, I am looking at the plane x equal to 0. We will go away from the plane x equal to 0 later. Uh, that's quite an interesting job. But at x equal to 0, you don't worry about kx times x is 0. So you have ky times y, but ky is k sine theta, k being the magnitude, omega by c or 2 pi by lambda, and sine theta is being approximated by theta. Uh, you remember our paraxial optics, same thing. And now we are going to superpose all values of theta from minus alpha to plus alpha. And you have 1 over 2 alpha for the same reasons. Okay. And I have omitted uh, the modulation part. Okay. Uh, in this case, the average value of the y component is 0. Yeah. So this is simply going to become sine alpha y by alpha y by the same logic that we got earlier. So now we have multiple wave vectors arriving at some plane. Uh, 
and creating finite wave packet in Y. And uh, borrowing the previous result, right? the size is 2 pi by k times alpha. Now, 2 pi by k happens to be lambda, but lambda divided by alpha. Now, uh, if you remember your single slit diffraction, this is exactly the formula you have for the single slit diffraction pattern. Okay? But I'm not going to pursue those textbook topics. Right? Uh, and the mathematical form of the single slit diffraction is also of the form sine theta divided by theta. That's the illumination in this plane. So though I've shown all the waves arriving at one point, they're not really arriving at one point. Right? They interfere constructively at this point, and as I move up and down, they start interfering destructively as I increase y, and therefore you get this pattern. But I would like to uh, write this relationship the size of the wave packet in y is delta y. So delta y multiplied by alpha uh, and divided by lambda is 1. So why am I writing like this? The reason is I want to do something uh, strange. I want to multiply both sides by Planck's constant. Okay. So now delta y, alpha remains where it is. And then you have h over lambda. And the right-hand side, you have Planck's constant. Now, what is h over lambda? Um, if you have particles with the wavelength lambda, then Mr. De Broglie tells you that the momentum is p. And if you take the momentum p and multiply it by sine alpha, it will give you the y component of momentum. So therefore, delta y into the spread in the y component of momentum is Planck's constant. So this is a connection with quantum mechanics, if you like. And uh, I'm not doing something very original here. This is the argument used by Heisenberg to explain his uncertainty principle. Except he did one, one more clever thing. He gave the uncertainty principle for an electron, but he imagined this electron was being looked at by a microscope. And at the focus of a microscope, this is pretty much the situation, that you have waves arriving from all parts of the objective lens, and they create this kind of pattern. Um, so I'll actually stop here. Hmm? Uh, and uh, take questions, we are overshot by a little bit. Thank you, Professor Rajaram, for a wonderful lecture. Good morning, sir. Yes. Uh, uh, sir, I wanted to ask a question that um, in the Max Zender experiment with uh, one photon only, uh, it's uh, almost analogous to the Young's double slit experiment that uh, a photon has two possible paths for passing to the uh, 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 photon. We have two possible paths to go into, like it can be reflected or it can be transmitted at the splitter. Uh, so, uh, so when uh, uh, the or when one of the photons get 100% uh, reflected at the second stop, then isn't that 100% uh, reflection and uh, instance of observation that will break the wave nature of photon. Uh, okay. So uh, that's, that is uh, one of the first things that a good course on quantum mechanics uh, uh, addresses and the Feynman lectures volume three, one has a discussion. And I think you have summarized the crucial point that if you want to see the interference effect, like, let us say you have a Max Zender. Let's go to the Max Zender interferometer. No, a bit further down. Yeah. And let's say the light source is so weak that we're very confident there's only one photon sitting in the interferometer at any given time. It is still true that if you have symmetric paths, you will get 100% of the photons coming here. 100% and zero here. Hmm? Yes, sir. Uh, that's what is meant by saying that the fringes survive even at the single photon level. However, uh, uh, that leaves us with this problem that interference seems to be occurring between two paths. And if photon is indivisible, <laughs> then if the photon, let us say, took this path, then how does it even know about the other path? Okay. So the solution, which is very strange, but it is fundamental to quantum mechanics, is that if you don't look at which path the photon took, 
then in some sense, it gathers information from both the parts and its final fate at this beam splitter is determined by both the parts. And in the symmetric case, with 100% probability, it ends up here. Okay. However, suppose you want to be greedy uh, and find out which path it took. So for example, you could loosen the screws on this mirror a little bit. So when the photon hits it, the mirror bounces a little bit. Okay. Uh, yes. And in the early days of quantum mechanics, Einstein kept coming up with these examples which would violate the uncertainty principle. And Niels Bohr and Heisenberg kept coming up with clever answers to his clever objections. So here, what they show is that if you allow this uh, to recoil and you are able to measure its momentum and make sure that the photon took the upper path, that recoil disturbs the interference fringes and then you get equal probability back here and here. So, uh, Feynman has this remark uh, that in his uh, lecture one that the uncertainty principle protects quantum mechanics from logical contradictions. So, okay, thanks for that question. Long answer. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, next up is Sahil. Please go ahead, Sahil. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, sir, am I audible? Yes. Yes, you are. Yeah, so, sir, my question is uh, kind of really hypothetical, but uh, I think it's kind of important. What if uh, we don't have the existence of imaginary numbers? So can we see the uh, electromagnetic equations the way we are seeing it right now, as in without the use of uh, imaginary numbers? The way we used to solve the problems, the way we used them in optics or in any kind of uh, electrostatics or electrodynamics, can we still do them without the use of imaginary numbers? Uh, answer is yes. And in fact, if you look up Maxwell's treatise on electromagnetism, as far as I know, there are no imaginary numbers there. He did everything yeah, yes, with sir. real numbers. Yeah, yes, so as far as if you're doing wave optics alone, imaginary numbers are a luxury. They make life more comfortable. And in the end, you take the real part. But if yeah, you're okay. doing quantum mechanics, I think uh, imaginary numbers, I mean, complex numbers are needed. So that would be my brief answer to your question. Oh, oh, okay, sir. thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, Arjun, go ahead. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, so, I wanted to ask whether, the, like, uh, could you explain the Michelson interferometer in the context of uh, gravitational waves? Uh, there was a question on detection of gravitational waves. And uh, yeah, I basically deflected that question. Are we taking more questions? I don't see any hands uh, raised, raised uh, right now. If there are any more questions, please use the raise hand button. Yeah, we give a little time. And uh, at least for the students who are registered for the course, they will have another opportunity uh, when we resume. Because we will resume in a common session. I will walk you through the problem yeah. and then, uh, yeah. So I see one hand, uh, hand raised, uh, Shivani Jain. Please go ahead. Uh, sir, in the uh, phase conjugate mirror topic, uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, the actually wavefront can be reflected uh, totally 180 degrees. So uh, in the when uh, normal reflection case we have the condition that uh, means uh, angle of reflection is equal to angle of incidence and uh, the wave front uh, which is diverging after reflection is also diverging so uh, how does that happen or where does that happen that actually every wave vector is 180 degrees uh, reflected mm. okay uh, i should have mentioned that my discussion of phase conjugation will be incomplete but I won't tell you how this magic is actually achieved. Okay. Um, uh, if you see that video, you will see that you use a very special kind of crystal. There are many ways of achieving phase conjugation. This particular crystal called barium titanate um, has a property called photorefraction. That is, its refractive index gets changed depending on the light intensity falling on it. Now, this goes beyond the realm of what is called linear optics. Right? Uh, linear optics is when the properties of the medium are not modified by the light wave. Right? So this belongs to the realm of nonlinear optics. 
uh, and what I have to tell you, I will not tell you the, you really have to go quite deep into it, but you can look up some of the articles. What I will tell you is that a function like phase conjugation uh, cannot be achieved by normal optical components like mirrors and so on. The reason is that the medium has to know something about the wave, right? It has to change its properties to send back the wave. So it has to be a kind of adaptive medium whose properties get changed by the wave. I, I will leave it at that. Um, because otherwise, this would be a whole course in itself on nonlinear optics. Right. Uh, sir, so every possible wavelength cannot be phase conjugate reflected. No, no, that's that's certainly true. There are every such device has some limitations in terms of the range of wavelengths and so on. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Professor Rajaram, we have a quick question on the YouTube chat actually. So yes, I guess yes, you have yes, already. Uh, yeah, you have that already person addressed. is still listening. Uh, I'm happy so, to take so, the question. Yeah, it's from Rupesh. He's saying uh, the 180 degree phase shift on reflection in the Michelson interferometer. Could you please explain it? Um, I don't think I mentioned the 180 degree phase shift. So uh, I think I did mention a 90 degree relative phase shift between R and T. Uh, that is the uh, transmission coefficient and the reflection coefficient. Okay, so uh, let me shall I let me share the screen and see if uh, so. It's really I was talking of a problem of a beam splitter, right? Where I was saying in order to have energy conservation, uh, the phases of T and R have to differ by plus minus pi by two. Now here I gave it as a kind of uh, uh, mathematical argument saying that the sum of the squares of this amplitude and this amplitude which is the energy flowing into the beam splitter should equal the sum of the absolute squares of this amplitude and this amplitude which is the energy coming out of the beam splitter right so that's the left hand side of this equation and the right hand side of this equation and this should be true no matter what a or what b you send into the beam splitter so this should be an algebraic identity. That means the coefficient of every term, a bar a, b bar b, a b bar, and you know, should all be the same on both sides. So what it turns out is that the coefficient of uh, this quantity is r bar r plus t bar t, which is one. So that has to be one. And that we can get from an elementary energy conservation argument of sending in just one and zero and getting R and T. But interestingly, if you want the other coefficients also to vanish, then you get this condition. So that you have to do a bit of algebra to, uh, in fact, that can also be done as part of the problem. And then I rearrange this equation. Maybe that is where, the, uh, sorry, that's maybe that's where the 180 degree phase shift came in. There's a minus sign here. But R bar over R, uh, if R has some phase phi, this has a phase minus 2 phi, right? Because R bar has a phase minus phi and there's another phi in the denominator. So this has a phase minus 2 phi 1 and this has a phase minus 2 phi 2 and those two have to differ by 180 degrees. That means phi 1 and phi 2 have to differ by 90 degrees. Huh? So that's the more detailed argument. I, I hope uh, Rupesh is still online and he gets this reply. So there's an extra factor of i, square root of minus 1, between r and t. And that also came out in the next, yeah, in this one. <laughs> that uh, 